see if everybody is. Uh, I know that there's quite a few of you guys who are going to watch this on catch up. I know that the pubs uh, are open. You're all looking for uh, pubs are open. What's going on? Yeah, pubs are open. Can you believe like it? Outdoor, outdoor, uh, or indoors. Outdoor <laughs> drinking. Yes. Outdoor yeah, drinking. It's the best drinking. Is it going to change on the 21st, though? That's the thing. Did, uh, do you know? Brent, have you heard? Is it going uh, to change? Or is he going well, to delay it pubs, again? Pubs. Well, I, I, I had the, a meal and uh, a drink inside a pub the other day. So, yeah. Inside a pub. Oh, yeah. that sounds so nice. It's nice and snuggly oh. and just so warm considering the weather this week has been atrocious oh, yeah it was brutal we oh. went away there for a few days actually and uh we got lucky we left on the sunday and we got three days of, of absolutely banging sunshine right which was very lucky and then just one and a half days of just torrential rain and when you've got kids inside the house it's like oh my god what do we do yeah but, uh, yeah, yeah. A trip to Smith's and uh, just <laughs> get whatever you want. Keep you quiet for an hour. Yeah, it's great. But, uh, um, we went to, guys, we went to Sulcum. You ever been to Sulcum? Oh, I saw. Oh, I saw you took oh, those oh, pictures. Go on. Absolutely that? beautiful. We went to so Sulcum. It's it's kind of uh, it's just south of Exeter. If you go straight south from Exeter, and it's just oh, yeah. the most. It looked exotic. Beautiful. The picture you sent was unbelievable. The light is just beautiful, and the no beaches way. are un un incredible, incredible, incredible. So we were walking. We took the dogs. We didn't take the children. Oh, nice. Nice. Now we're talking. <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic. It was really fantastic. I took one day off work. And I've been paying for it ever since. Yeah. I've been running to stand still yeah. ever since. Yeah. But it was so beautiful. And we picked up three kilos of mussels on the way home. And Lovely. Amazing. Very nice. Uh, the best mussels I've ever had in my life. What? Yeah. Are you yeah. Them up off the beach? Big, juicy, proper, beautiful, tasty mussels. Lovely. Couldn't believe it. Mm. Couldn't yeah. believe it. How about you, Bren? What have you been up to? Oh, I've uh, been travelling over the country, went up to the lakes, um, left my wife in charge of the goats, scared oh. the Jesus out of her. Um, but <laughs> what, you just took the dogs? Yeah, just took, well, just took Artie, actually. Uh, Artie's my little shadow. She comes everywhere with me. So uh, went up to see a horse up in the lakes and um, uh, did some woodland work. So just to have the guy around just checking out the uh, ecology of the woods you have these people that come around and inspect for you for natural Eng England and uh, you have woods yeah a bit of woodland do some conservation work oh, he's a landowner nice <laughs> yeah <laughs> I knew you had a field <laughs> I knew you had a field and a little tractor but I thought that was just a kind of a thing no, to that's local. Like a farm. Oh, no. up in the, up in the lakes yeah yeah we do some work for yeah just a bit of wildlife so yeah it's really good mixed woodland uh, it's in really good Form at the moment so uh, nice. uh, we've managed to stay away from the plantation stuff um and uh, yeah it's really really good and then a little trip up to scotland uh and then back down so yeah it's been a busy week very nice and, got the places really opening up and we're talking about uh that's pubs and just taking a trip to scotland isn't it mad how things are opening up now and yeah, you know, yeah. The way we were six months ago well, let's hope that doesn't go back that way although it's all, all very strange walking around edinburgh is, yeah you know you expect it to be really busy and it it's would be. like deserted yeah that's just like you know relatively i mean yes there's some people but it was relatively deserted so we went to edinburgh there we went to edinburgh for the hogmanay one year and we slept in a mini cooper uh and it was minus six outside and it was just it was so cold that the water froze on the windscreen so we had to kind of pour essentially beers on the windscreen as we were driving to get us to Hogmanay. And then when we got there, the bloody IRA did a bomb scare. And it was called off. So we just got there and it was all these people just furious. And, and then we had to sleep in the car. So uh, yeah, don't sleep in the car. And, and, you, and you didn't put your accent out there at all. <laughs> no, no. I put on my best Scottish accent. <laughs> my best Scottish accent. My best English accent. Hello, my man. Hello. I'll find his tail. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, guys, I just wanted oh. to mention two posts that I did. Uh, Brian, you put me onto that book, Deep Nutrition, which uh, yeah. I didn't really get to any of it on my holiday because it's just they're the sort of books that would be, yeah. But uh, I loved one of the quotes that she that I, I dug out of the book a while ago. Um, very simple, but it really was, uh, it, it, it got me. She said, every bite you take changes your genes a little bit. And I just thought, oh, that's a brilliant line. You know, it's not like, uh, like yeah, like, you know, anyway, look. Every, every bite is influential. That really blew me away for the rise of chronic disease in humans and stuff. 
Um, and I also finally put up that uh, infographic. Do you remember the infographic I shared in the Raw, um, the Raw Food and Veterinary Society conference a couple of years ago? I put that up um, yeah. there during the week, which was just showing the deaths from various things in dry dog food. And um, complete raw, we're still to have a, a canine uh, death on the on in the in the studies. And it's kind of it's, it's just I look, I very much enjoyed putting that up. So that went good old. That really went around and stirred a bit of poo as well with some uh, some groups. So it was very fun. So yeah. just, right. 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 before we get before we get into it, we've got some notices. Yeah. yeah, we've got some notices. Uh, the first thing is uh, for next week. If every uh, the, when, we, when we did a poll, it went down really, really well. So I think if we can do another poll this week for the next, I don't know, the next four days, four or five days, say. Um, so if any, if 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 every, anybody has any ideas for what we you'd like us to do for next week, please put it down here, and then I will make a poll for for the team on the Patreon. Everybody who's joined Patreon can then take a vote. Yeah. Okay, seems like a, a democratic way of doing it. And then, uh, Connor, you've got a notice about, um, yeah, like we were thanking Paleo uh, Ridge. Paleo, Paleo Ridge, Ridge uh, are kind enough to offer uh, a coupon here, a discount. So, you check out their new website, paleoridge.co.uk, and they have a five pounds discount code off your order, uh, and use the code raw pet medics at the checkout. And so, five pounds off any of your Paleo Ridge orders until the 31st of May. So get on it, guys. Uh, free money for you. If you're buying Paleo Ridge, it's just got five pounds cheaper. So thanks to Paleo Ridge. They've been very good supporters of us for the last uh, two months at least. So it's, it, they've been uh, so good to us. So thanks very much, Paleo Ridge. So Raw Pet Medics is the code, guys. Check it out on paleoridge.co.uk. Um, so yeah, guys, this week we are talking about uh, carbohydrates. I mean, we would need the whole week to be talking about carbohydrates. Uh, you know, it is a huge, huge topic. It's 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 so much it's so much part of every dog's diet, it seems. Uh, so could I start us off and just kind of um, I do a I do a little kind of a webinar thing on carbohydrates, and uh, the, I just want to give you the first. Few Before you do that, guys, are you all ready? You've all been clamoring for this. You know what's coming, yeah. Connor. Lightly touch paper. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to be calm. I'm going to be calm this week. Oh, I, don't, I don't want to be known as the ranty guy. Oh, my slides have just disappeared. I'm about to get some nipping. Less calm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. okay so, yeah, guys, listen. What we need yeah. to do is because we could do at least ten episodes of carbs. Let's yeah. keep it really, really simple. Yeah. We'll just do the simple stuff. So if anybody's offended by that, sorry, but. Okay. Just really, let's keep it simple, and then the next time we can add a little bit more, and the next time a bit more, and then we can get really fancy. Yeah. So be good. let's keep it simple. Keep it yeah. simple. So, Connor, before you go on to all of the study stuff, mm. give the guys out there what you would say carbs are, and what's what really mm. are we talking mm. about as a problem? What are the problem carbs? Yeah. Well, like you know, even that's a that's a look, that's that's a whole forty-five minutes right there. But <laughs> I think. People people think about um, you know sugar anyway. They think about sugar as the as the kind of worst carb, you know. And I think a lot of people don't understand that starch, like potatoes, chips, flour, uh, all the stuff that you know, ultra processed ingredients that are used in in dry pet food. That is as close to sugar as it needs to be. The body so quickly digests that it just rapidly hits the blood sugar. So you've got this thing called the glycemic index. Um, and they kind of it tells you what foods have loads of carbohydrates. So things like rice and bread, we don't look at them like sugar, but your body does. That is almost pure sugar to your body. One tiny digestive step. Starch is just nothing to the body. Um, so those sort of carbohydrates, uh, you would should be eating, keeping to a, the refined carbohydrates that pack a punch. You should be keeping them to a minimum in humans. Uh, and you know that that would be the the, the danger carbs you i think some uh, carbs are okay a little bit here and there and we, i'm sure we'll talk about it again but you know it's the meals and the flowers and the wheat and the corn and the stuff that we know we can't be putting too much of into us uh, what about you guys what are your i, th I think that i think that it's the refined the more refined it is the further you get from its natural state the more dangerous it is and i and i don't use that word lightly i think no. if you're if you're having refined carbohydrates and sugars over a long period there are you know all the big authors tim noakes and uh fung and gary taubes and t schultz and uh all the all the greats all the contemporary leading edge nutritionists are saying there is a straight line between those refined carbohydrates in humans 
and obesity, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, all these things, all the modern ills. So the idea that we turn around and feed our dogs on refined, steam processed carbohydrates ready, they're, they're half digested by the time they get in the bowl. And uh, how can we how can we expect health from feeding something that it, with us, we're omnivores, so we're arguably better press, uh, better set yeah. to, to digest these kind of things, we then feed them to carbohydrates and wonder why they cause so much disease. That's, yeah. there you go, in a nutshell. The same diseases, in fact, the ones you just mentioned. I mean, obesity and dogs are 10 times more likely to get cancer than humans. 10 times more yeah. likely. Uh, we've got an obesity epi epidemic in pets that mirrors what happened in humans hitting in the red Absolutely. at the same time for the same reasons. And not among a number of other issues, uh, all kind of very much carbohydrate. What about you, Bren? What are your what's your opening thoughts on carbohydrates? Yeah, I I, I sort of looked at this whole thing because you know that um, the real food on trials sort of like that we talked about earlier in the year, and then you look at some of the studies that they were talking about those those illusions of studies that were from the forties yes. and fifties where they actually had companies. Yeah, they, they'd look at 21 countries and then they'd streamline it down to the seven that <laughs> fit their model, okay? And then they'd publish on the basis of, well, look, these diets, obviously you can cope with a higher carb in your food and we can produce that, strangely enough, really cheaply. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, all of a sudden they came out with these guidelines that promoted high carbohydrate diets. Yeah. Guys, look. What's that doing to the human population? Is that working after, yeah. what was it, four decades, five yeah. decades? Yeah. It's still that a problem. Food, that was the food uh, pyramid know. we grew up with now, as you say it. You know, it was yeah. all carbs on the bottom, bread and potatoes yeah. and rice and stuff. I was like, you know, bloody hell. Yeah. But it is the refined. We've got to understand, it's look, carbohydrates yeah. also are used by plants for structure. You know, they, they, yeah. they you know, they, they could be considered in there. Um, but the, it's the starches and, and the storage routes and, and things like that that, effectively store those energy um, levels which are then released but some of those are also some of the the cellulose and things like that are really good for maintaining gut flora in some respects and actually what people don't understand and I know Nick you want to talk about this in, in a moment but actually it's not just the calories from the actual starches going in actually what our gut bacteria do is use that stuff to produce volatile fatty acids which we use for energy you know so actually there's a bit of a double whammy of you know you can think that you're being really great and and you know keeping your calories down within your diet by various ma methods but actually your bacteria are working really hard to to also support you symbiotically and you knew i was going to talk about microbiome today <laughs> yeah it was the same yeah. <laughs> had to slip it in there yeah but, I think uh, ultimately there's other stuff that Nick's going to talk about later on, but I would say uh, I'm, you know, if you're going to use any seed of any description, I would say sprouting seed and then ferment it for me would always be a good option if histamine is not an issue. Okay. We're, we're definitely, another week. Uh, we're definitely but, talking about fermented veg. We're going to bring that up soon because yeah. it's something we've been bouncing around a lot, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I want to learn. So, but I would say, um, yeah, I, I'm really anti sort of highly processed stuff that gives sugar punches uh, to us as well as to our dogs. I don't yeah. think it's appropriate. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of things with insulin resistance, etc. But Connor, you've got some studies here that you yeah. really want to punch through with. Let's well, just, yeah, through. just to keep it like, you know, if just to run through four or five slides here like if we kind of a lot of the people on here tonight are raw feeding they kind of accept that you know dogs in the wild eat real food ingredients and not you know stuff in packets and if you were to kind of ask a hundred nutritionists they'd all disagree but you know the dog eats a lot of meat muscle and um, you know a bit of excreting organ a bit of bone and maybe a bit of veg although you know you could have them split in two there whether people feed veg or not but that's roughly what the dog's diet is but in short, a lot of meat muscle, a bit of organ meat, bone, and a bit of veg, that is a huge protein diet. Like dogs in the wild don't go scavenging uh, in wheat and cornfields and that kind of stuff. Carbohydrates just aren't on the, on the menu. And so we have lots of studies of dogs showing that when they're left to their own devices, free of human influence, most importantly, they don't eat carbohydrates at all. They, they go after their, their, their protein sources, their meat, anything with a face. Um, so the, th the thing is, we like... 
we know while the studies show dog, I'm just reading a couple of slides here. The dog has zero metabolic need for plant carbohydrate. Okay, so everybody agrees with that, even AFCO and the NRC and that kind of those sort of groups. Um, beagle fed pups uh, on carbohydrate free diets all exhibit a normal blood glucose concentrations, growth rates, and weight gain over years. So there are the sort of studies you want to see tracking dogs over years on a carbohydrate carbohydrate free diet. Wouldn't it be interesting to track dogs over years on a high carbohydrate diet? Uh, they're the sort of studies that aren't in these behemoth of books that we have to kind of read. Um, but taste trials by the actual companies themselves reveal that when dogs are offered to feed ad lib, so there's your protein, there's your fat, there's your carbs, sort of. Um, they eat about 7% carbohydrates. They choose to include about 7% 7 carbohydrates. Those studies were riddled with flaws because the dogs came into it eating cereal-based pet food. So in my opinion, that's setting you up to fudge the results. But uh, And that study has been repeated since. And now we know that dogs will initially pig out on fat, but over time they increase more protein. That was Mark Roberts, lads. Um, and uh, they increase more protein and decrease the fat. Okay. So we know that dogs eat lots of protein when left to their own devices. That's what they do. And the studies show that they don't need carbohydrates. But this, the fact remains that we had that study a few years ago, 2014, where we found that dogs do have some more copies of the gene AMI2B for producing, for digesting carbohydrates. So dogs historically in the past have been fed and have been consuming carbohydrates. That's a fact. You wouldn't evolve these genes out if they weren't useful to you. You know, you don't do that. It's a, the body's smarter than that. Also, the liver of the dog and the dingo produces hepatic gluconase, which cats don't. And dogs are much better at assimilating glucose than cats, okay? So we know there's a couple of little signs in there that dogs have been historically eating a bit of carbohydrates. But as Nick mentioned at the start of the talk, and now I'm just gonna rob your line, Nick, um, just because they can digest that stuff and because they have like an ability to digest it doesn't mean that this should suddenly be a furious amount of their diet. It's Doug Newman said it to Dr. Gene Dodds the best. He said, just because we can digest ethanol and sucrose doesn't mean 50% of my diet should be rum and cookies. Uh, it's such an obvious point. It's like, but no. Um, anyway, so, you know, insidious kind of people can kind of say, oh, those, those, those genes, we knew they could... Um, they use it as a as reason to include more carbohydrates. So here's a great quote. I just want to read this out from a from a very good uh, dry pet food producer here. Um, this is from Waltham, um, very scientific. And they said, when ranked with other major ingredients that supply protein and fat, carbohydrates are generally considered the least important and are often regarded as the filler ingredient. To the contrary, carbohydrates do not provide bulk in the diet. Instead, they provide an excellent source of metabolizable energy for dogs. That's what the dry food manufacturers are saying. And I don't think anybody disagrees that, you know, chocolate bars and donuts and stuff are an excellent source of energy. It's are they an, a useful form of energy? For healthy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's just this, it's this twisted kind of logic that, you know, oh, it's great energy. Ironically, when you run dogs in trials, so Cronfield, Hinchliffe, Loftus, a couple of the big sled teams, they ran dogs on high carbohydrates. These would be sled dogs, guys, sorry. Medium carbohydrate diets and zero carbohydrate diets. Listen to this. For, I took this from the conclusions. Dogs on zero carbohydrates, sled dogs, this is the hardest working dogs out there, on zero carbohydrate diets maintained higher blood concentrations of albumin, calcium, magnesium, and free fat, fatty acids during the racing season. They also exhibited the greatest increase in red cell blood count, hemoglobin concentration, and pack cell volume, which is why, you know, the cyclists training at the higher altitudes and stuff, you know, these are good measures of fitness. The authors conclude that a carbohydrate-free diet appeared to confer an advantage for prolonged strenuous running in terms of metabolic responses to training. In, in other words, if carbohydrates were a good source of energy, don't you think that these sled dogs would be performing better on them, you know? So it's, it's just a nonsense. And just to finish... Uh, and I've, I feel myself getting worked up here, but um, like just to finish, like when you go to the small animal clinical nutrition book, you know, a massive 1300 pages, thousands and thousands of references, and you go to the bit that teaches you, this, you they, these companies are using 50, 60 percent of the dog's diet as carbohydrates. You think there'd be some really solid science behind that, wouldn't they, if it's not a filler ingredient? And so when you go to the section that's entitled canine carbohydrate requirements, which itself is just an oxymoron because dogs don't have any requirement for them whatsoever, you've got 
two paragraphs, two tiny little paragraphs in this massive book. So half their diet is afforded two little paragraphs. And in it, they quote the Ramsos study in 1981, which I love talking about. It's just they compared two groups of dogs. One fed a moderate fat diet and the other, um, they were pregnant bitches. They fed them a hugely fat, fat diet, so lean diet and really fat diet. And what they found was that the dogs on the higher fat diet started um had issues with the pups and stuff and they concluded that oh well the dogs needed some carbohydrates to balance it out like this study was so flawed and the conclusions of it so bloody erroneous like it wasn't that the dog needed carbohydrates it's because you were feeding a huge amount of fat to the dogs and for these big books to use that study as and that, that along with two other studies both of pregnant bitches uh, and that's it uh, on the back of that, they conclude in this carbohydrate requirements section, overall, a minimum of 23% carbohydrate is recommended in foods for gestating and lactating bitches. No study ever concluded that. Excess starch in the food typically does not cause health problems in dogs, completely unreferenced. Dry extruded dog foods typically contain 30 to 60% carbohydrates, mostly starch, and cause no adverse effects. No reference. Can you believe a scientific manual would say 30 to 60% carbohydrates, mostly starch, cause no adverse effects in dogs. And that's coming from a, a book that calls itself the most comprehensive, practical, small animal nutrition uh, resource available, certainly the most widely read. So that's the start of the carbohydrate thing. I just wanted to sow. That's the background science behind. Literally sow the seeds. Yeah, sow the seeds, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's how you know what? I really is so respectful. They're saying that was the calmest. Your holiday must have suited you. Really. Has, yeah. <laughs> well. You are. That was the calmest rant of the <laughs> year so far. There you um, go. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, do you know what? There's, there's so much out there that the nutritionists that you talk about also – have this miscomprehension that processed stuff that's cooked to death and you know changed beyond belief by processing is exactly the same as anything in its raw form as well do you not come across that so often that they they will just you know they they liken it whenever they do a you know somebody asked earlier and, and they said what proportions of you know protein to fat to carbohydrate should we be putting in as the macronutrients for for a dog's diet you know what is the recommended amount and you know we've got people out there that they don't comprehend the difference between feeding raw um, and feeding something that's been through various cooking, sometimes triple cooking processes yeah um uh, and think that it should have exactly the same now if you read all of these books that we've been talking about they all seem to have that similar view well actually no it changes it massively. It totally, you know, even the fats, you know, if you're giving plant fats, you know, what you will do to change those if you superheat them and then, you know, reheat them and, and produce them and then let them go off in a bag for however long shelf life, you know, two years sometimes these dry foods will say they've got on the shelf life, you know, how that changes those things. So yeah. there are so many changes that we've got to watch out for here. Um, and I would definitely say, don't just think, oh, well, it's, you know, carbs are bad. It's also the processing that just accentuates that so yeah. massively. Yeah, I I'm think just gonna, I'm just, guys, I'm just going to reiterate because I'm just looking at some of the comments. I'm just going to reiterate that the, that uh, vegetables are do contain carbohydrates. But when we talk about carbs in this kind of dismissive and 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 uh, despairing sort of way, we're generally talking about refined wheat and corn. Yeah, it's it's wheat and corn flours that have then been cooked, and I would say up to six times they they've been heated and cooled and heated and cooled and heated and cooled in the extrusion process to produce kibble, and that ultra ultra processing is is a carbohydrate but you cannot in a million years put it in the same category as an as a fresh bit of broccoli yeah yeah that's true actually you know what i'm saying i think it's really important again let's let i'd like to really define the basics so what connor has said absolutely rightly is that when dogs left to their own devices choose only a tiny amount of carb and they really go for fat as their main energy source and yeah. protein is secondary to that and carbs are just the tail end charlie and they're for cereal fed dogs there are dogs coming into the trials eating cereal based pet food so that's a normal food for them to eat so they'll eat yeah. it i wonder if you did the trial on real raw fed dogs 
how much of that stuff they need. I think every dog likes a bit of mashed potato, you know. But yeah, yeah. Didn't you do a study on uh, dogs, uh, village-fed dogs who'd been raised on, on I don't know, porridge or, kind of stuff. Or, yeah. or bread or something, and they had a slightly different tilt towards eating more that, carbs right. than yeah. a wild so you, can, yeah, you can you can produce a study there's like diet studies would be you know i, I love them but you can produce a diet study that shows dogs in india uh, are eating 40 percent plant material and you can hold it up and say that's why we use 60 percent corn in our diet because these this study here of village dogs in india they're eating a lot of plant material but actually there's a big difference between studies of village dogs, free roaming dogs, which are dogs that are let out and roam around the place. The roaming laws are lax, so they feed in dumps during the day and they come back and live with their humans. These are generally poorer regions and, and poorer people don't waste any meat protein on their dogs. You know, they get they get fed the plant remains. So when these poor village dogs are assessed, they, they you know, they call these dogs, we find that they've got more plant material in them, but almost across the board, the, the authors will say when they're out hunting, they're hunting meat, they're eating poo, they're eating all sorts of things to try and top up their failing protein reserves, which is a line that Butler Detroit uses, who's one of the biggest people in it. Uh, but when you look at feral dogs, the feral dog diet is just meat and, and bone in the poo. But, but it's not even meat, meat is it? It's it's animals. It's they animals. will eat, they eat animal, skin. Animal protein is probably skin better. and yeah. testicles and brain mm. and lungs and the whole kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they eat the whole thing. They eat the whole rabbit, the whole rat, the whole, the whole, rat, the whole, the whole mouse. thing. They yeah. eat absolutely yeah. the whole thing. So when we say meat, we, it's not really even. We're not really talking about meat. We're yeah, talking it's about not like yeah animals. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You yeah. know, because when we talk about meat, it's like a, 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 a joint of beef on a Sunday, whereas for a dog. A rabbit is an entire meal. Yeah. The eyes and the teeth and mm. the lungs and the everything yeah, yeah. all go in the same way. Yeah, that's right. In relation to the macronutrient bit, if I could just come back to that. Yeah. If it, I would say that when we look at the diets of dogs and dingoes, we've better studies on the dingoes, but when we look at their uh, diet, they would have existed they do exist on very lean animals there's no fat animals in the wild really because if you're a fat you're a cheeseburger you know so generally you know bar the young ones when they're born your animals are pretty lean light on their feet lizards birds uh, frogs you know rabbits you're talking like six seven eight parts protein to one part fat their bodies are when you suck all the moisture out of them and have a look at them very very lean animals so we have to assume that dogs evolved on a lean protein diet to some degree farmed meat is a lot fattier and stuff so if you were to ask me like the macronutrient thing i'd say well very quite lean diets would be probably the normal for these long distance running animals very lean bodies long distance running kind of diet you know so in the macronutrient thing i would have said a lot of protein a bit of fat but i use a bit of carbs like a cold winter morning i'm eating a bit of porridge i put that in and i heat up his meat because i feel bad for him i just think that he wants to eat it a bit warmer and I, I do dump a little bit of carbs on him now and again, now and again, because I know he can handle it, but it's just not something that if I was advising a raw company, you know, I, I wouldn't be putting in carbs in the in the recipe because it's not something that the dogs need at all. Yeah, you know? so that's an interesting, you know, I've popped this one up a couple of, well, a few people have asked about, you know, the, the companies that use sweet potato and mm. you know, they'll use butternut squash and, and things like that. What's your thoughts on that? I'm not happy with that, to be honest. No. I don't think it's just not necessary. I think they put it in because people expect it. I think they put it in because it's cheaper than meat. Uh, and I'm not denigrating them, but they, this is the way they, they, it all works no. at the moment. But when I'm advising people, I will say, why don't we go for greens? They, they've got a much greater nutrient density. I will use sweet potato and squash and things like that as a for constipated dogs and what have yeah, you. Great, great for constipated dogs. But not in every meal for years and years I, if i had to be on one car carb source it would be greens leafy green vegetables the kind of things that children don't want to eat they're the ones that are good for you yeah what do you um, think boys I, I think the sweet potato thing like and it comes back to what we started off with at the start as bren was saying i think like we need to remember that like you know carbohydrate to the body you know car potatoes are potatoes essentially you know so a high carbohydrate diet is nearly irrelevant what form we're talking if you're going to include sweet potato 50 percent of a, of a dry food diet that is still a very high carbohydrate 
high sugar diet for a dog. So it, it nearly doesn't matter what form they put it in. It's great that it's not wheat because wheat's just the, the, the devil. But, you know, I don't see a huge difference between corn and sweet potato. Sweet potato comes with a bit more fiber, probably some more nutrients. Not by the time they've smashed it to bits. It's, it's just carbohydrate filler. It took off because we didn't want to see wheat on the labels anymore. So grain-free pet foods evolved. Grain-free. Grain-free. So yeah. it's, the grain, it's the avoidance of grain. It's not because sweet potatoes were the better ingredient. If you wanted a really, you know, you'd make a very high meat diet. Yeah, they need the carbohydrates and kibble to bind us. For the extrusion process so you need a bit of carbohydrate in there but now the pet foods are getting higher and higher meat protein lower and lower carbs but that means more and more ultra processed cooked meat is that a good idea uh we don't know it's, they don't know we just yeah, don't know sure. so it's a tough question that the sweet potato thing so there's a, a few things that have popped up there um we've got a little bit about things that you've talked about vegetable matter um you know somebody asked about the cellulose in cabbage and do we need to cook that and i would say well look oh. to ferment it okay that's what sauerkraut is at the end of the day um so those are it can release you know one of connor's favorite um manganese uh you know uh, supplements in hair and, and yeah. uh, hooves and things like that. Actually, also is quite high in good fermented cabbage. So just have oh, a look at that. Cool. Apparently it's, uh, it's a so big... I like cooking then, guys. Do you agree with a lot? Like if you were going to use some of the coarser greens, would you give any of them a light like cooking first? Would I, you... I would shred them and ferment them. What would you do, Nick? I would I would stick them in the blender. And so, yeah. I, I would only I would only cook them before i stick them in the blender if it was an older dog or if that really changed the do dog's digestion for the better what about you connor so, yeah, I, I would give my the greens a little bit like i haven't leapt onto the fermented veg thing so we are going to go through uh, an episode at some stage where mm. uh, you guys are going to talk about fermented fermented veg and i'm going to try learn a bit about it but yeah. um so i kind of give it a light like cooking because i do ever since and we could this is another topic but it's the exact same topic, in fact. Another type of carbohydrate is fiber. Plant fiber is a carbohydrate, as you said at the start, Brian. You have two types of fiber. You have soluble fiber and insoluble fiber, one that dissolves in water, one that doesn't. Uh, and now we suspect strongly that it's the ins it's the soluble fiber that's linked to these high amounts of bloat cases in dogs with deep chests. We know now that it's the gas coming up from the intestines, not air in from the mouth. So it's not the speed of eating or resting after a meal. None of that changes how much attacks of this GD, this bloat with torsion you're going to get. So we know it's the gas coming up from the intestines. And so fiber is one of the chief uh, suspects in that because dry food is, is a massive risk factor for this. So, um, uh, but it's the, also, it's also greens, remember for GDV, the gas that's coming up isn't just also refluxing in in those bloat situations. Yeah. What you're actually getting is fermenting of um, carbohydrate biscuit material in an enclosed. Because what happens is the stomach wraps, okay? And as it wraps around, it seals both ends. Um, just like, you know, rolling a plastic bag up, you know, to, to seal it, okay? And then what's then happening is you've got that fixed chamber of carbohydrate fermenting in its own okay. set stone. Yeah. And because of various things that happen in that fermenting process, you know, the acidity isn't as high, you know, with the, you know, there's, there's a lot of acid base balance stuff to talk about to, to what happens there, but it just basically the acidity isn't as high. You do end up having, um, you know, fermenting processes going on. And yes, that gas, as you rightly say, is not from air gulped in. Oh, it is fermenting stuff and th there are people out there that still have protested wildly that it's all about gulping air in but there's yeah. so many tests out there that have shown that that's not the case they, they actually release the bloke gas into a device so when they puncture the dog they can take the gas out and they can the gas is high in carbon dioxide so that's nearly but remember that is not going to be the level of you know we're not talking about fermented veg going into these dogs in sufficient levels that you're going to cause bloat in that sense okay yeah. uh so that's the difference that we're we're talking about there that's why i'd cook the greens though that's why i'm a little bit wary of like i don't feed a huge amount of uh likes of cabbage you know any of the cruciferous vegetables broccoli if you want your house to smell you know uh like but people do i use a bit of broccoli in the dog but brussels sprouts just don't work out for dudley uh but so i do use a fruit greens but i am a little bit wary of just too much fiber you know um i just don't think I'm a bit worried. That's why I would do a bit of cooking. I'm okay, so this brings us to the question, guys, about the, the big question within raw food is 
should you with it with a raw food diet should you feed just a meat-based diet or should you feed meat plus some vegetables and i remember one of you is is uh is more vegetable orientated than the other and i can't remember which of you is which i think it's brendan is anti too much veg and connor you're into a bit i'm, of I'm, I'm into a bit veg. Of veg. right which yeah. is right do you want to yeah. just give us where you stand on that shall we feed it just a pure meat diet or shall we feed a meat plus a little bit of green bit of where are you, brendan? Since connor goes up to yeah you go up to 30 percent. so i want to i want to hear you say why you think that's right because i'm i'm yeah, no, like I think I think I was most of the info, like you know, the conclusion of the book there, I would have been saying ten percent veg. You know, ten percent veg as a as a you know a little addition. I think there's so many nutrients to be had from vegetables pre presented in the correct way to dogs uh, that they just you can't exclude them from the diet. Yes, if all our dogs were eating wild prey that were foraging on leaves, you know, fields of clover. Yeah, that's a great rabbit. That's not the rabbits you're feeding, guys. Most of your rabbits are coming from France. Check out that industry for a meat industry. Most of the beef in the US comes from CAFOs, concentrated animal feed operations. These are guys are fed wheat and corn, not cereals that, that those animals should be eating. Nutrient bereft, high salmonella. So it's when you compare that to organic meat it's much higher in omega-3s and all sorts of stuff there is it's, it's not just wishy-washy stuff that you know this organic thing is about it's about you want your prey animals eating all the herbs and plants and berries because we know that prey animals bioaccumulate bits and pieces all around their body so when your dog eats the whole thing he's getting lutein from the eyes that zeaxanthin where else does the dog get zeaxanthin he doesn't eat plants so you know this is really important if your dog's eating wild prey. So it's come to the vegetable idea. It's like there are so many studies showing the benefits of including some plant material in dogs that I think it would be madness not to include a little handful of blueberries out in the grass. In the 30% thing, I'm, I now leave the door swinging widely open with veg inclusions because people then say, I've got three German shepherds. I can't afford to feed the three of these like carnivores. It's simple as that. I don't have the money to do it. Even though you can make cheap raw diets, you do go down a little bit of a slippery slope of quality, higher fat mixes. I'll sell you beef for a pound a kilo, but it's, you know, it's just beef, fat and blood. So that's not great for a dog either. So before you jump back to dry food to save money, I'd say, okay, use 20, 30% plant filler, but put in the correct plant filler that the dog can get on slightly better with as opposed to jumping to, back to kibble. You know, so I'm I'm okay with people using 33%, you know, ground up veg ingredients that we, you know, whichever ones are cool at the moment, you know, that's okay. It's better than 50, 60% corn from kibble, you know. Let me tell you my, my raw food journey. 25 years ago, when I first started looking, I thought, okay, um, let's go with the meat and two veg type scenario. So I was feeding about 40% uh, protein, mint mince with bone in it and then loads of loads of carrots and greens and and what have you and the labrador labradors plural did really well on that yeah. but over the years i have i have become more and more and more carnivorous so i'm now at the 10 to 20 percent level of uh greens mainly greens i don't like carrots i don't like roots yeah you know herbivores carnivores eat herbivores herbivores eat leafy greens you know primarily so i think why do we feed roots yeah so parsnips i don't really use and carrots and i don't really use and turnips i don't really eat. but and they're very 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 starchy so yeah my, my thought is 10 to, and this is an evolution ask me in five years time and i may be down to two yeah. percent greens i doubt it but i might be uh, and so I've evolved to, to get to the 10 to 20 percent. And I think the important thing is not to be static in your thoughts, is to talk to people and to do your reading and watch crazy programs on a Friday night and and educate yourself. Look at all the evidence and find a path through that that works, that works for you in your pocket, but also works for the dog. It may yeah. be that your dog is a 40 percent greens dog and that does really really well it may be that your dog can tolerate only a very small amount yeah so i think i'm being where, where are you brand where are you brand on that you're on the lesser carb lesser plant material uh bullseye. yeah I, I generally so i i love that that ideal of a third a third a third because it makes it simple for people tell us about that and i would just say so it's a a third of sort of minced 
meat so that that's usually fats and you stuff that's generally you would think of as just meat sort of uh, okay uh you then think about a third bone material so that's usually things like neck or wings or you know carcass because there's some meat on that so you know right. it's not just bone it's quite a lot of cartilage there's quite a lot of sinew there's quite a lot of other stuff with it so it probably averages out around about seven to ten percent bone actual bone in in those sort of bits and then you've got the, a third, which I think is really important part, as, as you pointed out, Connor, you know, things like the eyes, the things like the, the organs, the organs are so rich in nutrients, mm. such a vital, you know, everything from, you know, where you can get it, spleen, pancreas, but through yeah. to liver, kidneys, heart, lungs, yes. you know, uh, all of those can be really, really useful. Tripe, obviously, forgot to say, um, you know, have really important components you know there's a lot in a lot of these nutrition books where they talk about humans you know actually benefiting from eating these organs and actually where we've gone away from doing that because we're averse that you know we're not necessarily the better for it Deep nutrition um, actually was speaking about that wasn't yeah. you, um, absolutely but there's other bits about actually pasture-fed animals so you know i do like the idea of wild caught rabbit things like that that have had a good life you know they're, they're then you know great nutrition uh and yeah full of you know vitamin d full of vitamin c you know they're a great source of all of these things for our pets it's as you say if it's lot fed if it's cage fed inside a, a barn somewhere it's that's not going to have the same constituent so what i tend to say is in that last third which i talk about organs yeah Got contents for me. Now, this is, you know, Nick's fermented herbs, nuts and seeds sort of uh, thing uh, that sometimes talks about and, and uh, evolves through. Uh, but I would say that for me is literally mimicking the gut content yeah. that they would otherwise get. Now, my dogs, if, if we get a wild rabbit, they get the whole rabbit. They will eat the whole rabbit, you know, everything in it, including the fermented gut contents that they've had. Um, Yes, and I'm sure the guys out there watching will know that the typical, yeah, they come across, you know, some roaming feral horse on the, the moors and they'll find the, the feces and decide to uh, eat, not not they're gonna, not going to demolish the horse, don't worry, Nick. They're just going to take the feces and, you know, they'll chow down on that. And, you know, there's, there's little bits that they'll pick up, you know, along that side. They'll sometimes take out to the goat's feces and stuff like that and that's you on, know, the gut, on the yeah. gut contents thing actually though just to clarify animals bigger than rabbits you you are very unlikely to see a dog tucking into the contents of a cow or sheep belly so you'll see them picking off the fat from the outside but i've got videos of dogs eating sheep and they don't touch the belly it's just a belly left on the ground they pull it out and they leave it there but the they, they will the the intestine. they will go for the intestine which will be full of plant material they will eat the intestines and they'll leave out they'll leave out the stomach. But the rumen, yeah. you're talking about the rumen, yeah. and this yeah, is yeah. the first chamber that holds all yeah. the grass. It's yeah, that's the big, yeah, that's yeah. the big fermenting chamber in a lot of these big herbivores. And we've got to realize, you know, herbivores are designed. Yeah, you know, we think, oh, they're gonna be eating all of this carbohydrate material. No, what they're doing is they shove in loads of carbohydrate material, usually in grasses and things like that, which actually they feed to big vats of bacteria yeah. that are actually producing fats. Yeah. To sustain them. Yeah, yeah, that's, right. that's, that's what people need to understand out there. Mm -hmm. You know, these animals actually survive on the volatile fatty acids that are built that, by right. those bacteria. Fascinating, isn't it? It's like bloody hell. We are complete machines. Actually, I wanted to mention something. You touched on the biome thing. When people talk about having a sweet tooth, um, this is just kind of uh, illuminated to me a while ago. It just makes perfect sense. But you have a craving for for sugar, okay? And when you've got a craving, like some people say, I have a terrible sweet tooth. You know, you'd nearly punch a child in the face to take the bar away. So, you know, a really bad... <laughs> that's really, not something that we say that. We say that. absolutely <laughs> advocate. We're not talking about it. He's only joking. <laughs> He's only joking. A, pro a, a, proper, a proper sweet tooth that people think that, oh, I was born with this. Is it? That's not... That, that is a calling from inside your gut. That is your gut flora saying, give me sugar, give me sugar, give me sugar, give me sugar. It's not a healthy gut flora. That's a gut flora screaming for sugar. And what do you do? You eventually cave in because those chemical signals, 
they can actually induce this for you in you until you give them what they want. It's like being addicted to cigarettes and booze and everything else. It's the same addiction inside of you that you can't say no. So you eat the bit of sugar and what do you do? You feed what is a dysbiotic gut and then those, not baddies, but this bacterial group get louder. So the next time they're calling for it, it's like, get sugar, get sugar, get sugar. And next thing you know, you're chasing children around the street. Not so only that, you've also got hormones Yes, the, the hormones that they release do that to you, but they mimic all of the things like the ghrelins, which are about your, you know, your desire for more food, your, how hungry you are, etc. Um, yeah. all, all through to the, the leptins and, and the, uh, how you're satiated, all the way through to the, um, you know, the insulin itself and the release that that causes and insulin resistance that you can develop. You know, all of those are really important hormones yeah. that will drive you to effectively, this is why we called it a human addiction. Um, mm -hmm. And what we've done is actually um, in the process of following these 1977, I think was when the, the, the American guidance came out diets. from America about yeah. human diets. We actually allowed the pet food industry to follow that pattern mm -hmm. and actually allow our pets to fall into exactly the yeah. same trap yeah. um, yeah. that we have fallen into. Yeah. And yeah. And ours is self-inflicted. It's hard when you've got money in your pocket and you can buy any chocolate bar in the shop. It's bloody hard not to. Your dog is just eating the things that we give him the best. Give me give me the advice and I will feed it to my pet. That's the sad thing. You know, it's like we are putting that into, into the dog. He's not choosing that stuff, you know. Can I address a couple of things here? One person, actually good. Can you speak? I've heard this before in regards to carbohydrate usage. That a raw diet without carbohydrates is too high in phosphorus, causing stress on the kidneys. You know, there is it's wrapped up a million ways why they use carbohydrates one to drop the phosphorus contents on it is it's 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 it, it just doesn't have any scientific kind of grounding like a dog is a meat eating machine a protein eating machine the only studies we have are phos of, of phosphorus really harming kidneys so far is dry fed pets it's probably phosphates as opposed to natural phosphorus the body doesn't like minerals too much okay it likes vitamins it comes from the land of the living they don't like calcium and phosphorus and stuff that has to be bound to a carbon it has to be holding carbon's hand to get through the gut membrane the, the lads of the gut membrane are saying no unless you're you know with a carbon so f natural phosphorus is probably not an issue we've got all the studies we need of dogs where they lop off the kidney function of dogs and feed them higher and higher protein diets to see what happens and the dogs in the higher protein diets do better it, except near the end if you're suffering protein urea or whatever else so like the phosphorus thing is odious that i don't know where that pops up but it's repeated all the time it's, it's utter nonsense and somebody else mentioned back about carbs and cancer like we will have to do part two of this guys because the other end of this is really talking about which we haven't mentioned obesity diabetes cancer and bloat and it's like we haven't even touched on the fact that like you know tumors I do a whole day on this yeah, yeah. we could yeah yeah but we could. i would like to address one very much more simple thing somebody mentioned about grain-free diets being responsible for um dilated cardiomyopathy dilated, yeah dcm dilated yeah. cardiomyopathy can we just put to bed now there is no taurine in grains it was not around the grains being rich in taurine and therefore preventing it it was all about the fact that there were some modified diets out there that were not supplement these were processed diets which were not supplementing the diets appropriately because they were i think high in legumes and there was a thing about binding out some of the um the taurine uptake etc but realistically in raw diets that we're talking about the meats are super rich in taurine you know that's the whole point that's where taurine is coming from so just because your raw diet you know, your biologically appropriate meat-based diet for dogs is low in grains does not mean that they're still at risk of heart disease. All, all so, dry Sorry, Nick. Sorry, for me, the, the, the guy to, to talk uh, to, uh, go to YouTube and, and listen to is Ryan Yamka. He's speaking the most sense I know. I, I don't know whether you agree, guys, on the whole DCM thing. And yeah. he says there's a lot of nonsense spoken and there is not really a strong association between grain-free, general grain-free no, diets yeah. and DCM. 
it does, and there's a lot of politics and a lot yeah, of money, and money and behind it. Even then, yes. 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 And yeah. I think like all, all extruded, dry extruded pet food can cause DCM because there's so many reasons that it can reduce taurine in dogs. So too much fiber is going to reduce the ability to reabsorb taurine. If they don't put in enough methionine and cysteine, the precursors, like on and they use so little meat, there's hardly any taurine in there. Taurine is the Latin for bull, isn't it? That's where it yeah. comes from. So they're telling you it's coming from meat. But like, you know, there's there's five or six different things that can trigger uh, the dog's not reabsorbing bile and that kind of thing. So you can have a, a, a taurine deficiency for a lot of reasons that are pretty unique to dry pet food. So it's not, oh, it's not fair to pick on grain-free. The reason they picked on grain-free is because grain-free is taking over the market. Yes. Which means no more wheat and corn, cheapest of the cheap crap. And we've already put all our research and scientists behind this food. So we can't admit that we are complete bullshitters for the last 60 years. So we fight it. And unfortunately, if you can believe it, the FDA got involved with this. And uh, they they put their ore in, and it just shows that when we rely on somebody like the FDA, who at the, it can who is in charge of the FDA can change with whoever is in charge of the the, the Congress at the time. Like there is big problems there, and they have now shown their colours. What they did with that DCM thing, they named the companies involved. There was no links at the time. They suspected cases. They never did that for the melamine scandal when thousands of dogs were dying and pets. We weren't even told. The products that were or that they knew had too much melamine in them. We weren't told those companies because those companies were the big boys. So they don't mention those names, but they mentioned the grain free pet food companies. It was an odious repression. It was a witch hunt. Yeah. It was hideous, hideous. So yeah. Ryan Yamka is your man there. Right, guys, I'm going to stop you there. And I'm going to say, um, please, uh, please uh, have a look on Patreon, everybody. If you haven't joined Patreon, please do. It's a fantastic resource. Uh, it's very easy to join. Just follow your nose. Pet, it should be just down here in one second. And we'll do a poll for what we're going to talk about next week. We could do ca carbs too. We do carbs see. too, guys. Because well, guys, so question. many people have asked for us to do our next course on, on carbs. I mean, there is a weekend's worth easily. Let's do carbs part let's two. Do carbs can we do carbs part two next week okay. just to get it done okay. while it's fresh? And, and we'll address, guys, all the questions you put up here, we'll address them. Any other questions that... If we've started to sow the seeds of anything, ask us on Patreon and we'll bring them up. So we'll do, we'll get to these questions next week. So we'll fly through some of them and then let's get into the whole kind of uh, carbs and cancer, diabetes, uh, obesity, explain the link of, of what these high carbohydrate diets are doing to pets. Cool. I've put references to Gary Tabb's Case Against Sugar and Jason Fung in Patreon. So you guys can get into that. Yeah. Amazing books. Really, really, really mind blowing. And, and we'll put up other references, perhaps that phosphorus reference. Yeah, the organic yeah, yeah. phosphorus we'll versus the phosph phosphate ones. phosphates. Yeah. That's a goodie. So it's all happening there. We're going to see you next week at seven o'clock on Friday. And it's going to be Carbs Part Dieu. Absolutely. And don't forget your raw pet medics code at paleoridge.co.uk is going to get you five pounds off your Paleo Ridge orders until the 31st of May. So get on it, guys. Raw pet medics is the code to use. Five pound discount at paleoridge.co.uk. And thanks to them again for uh, the sponsorship. Awesome. So guys, thanks okay. for all of your very, very good comments. Uh, thanks to Dr. Nick Thompson, um, uh, who's that way. Uh, and well, well, well done, Brady. 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 That Brady. way, good. and good. I'm Dr. Brendan Clark. I uh, hope you've enjoyed tonight, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Awesome, Absolutely. take care, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you.